Morning, or evening, Grace Brethren, and sisters. Good to have all of you back along with us here with Old Testament Survey, and look forward to continuing through the book of First Kings uh, here uh, here today. And uh, we'll go ahead and have a word of prayer and get started. Our Father, we sure do love you. Thank you for the goodness of sin. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and all the help that you've given us for uh, uh, for allowing us to study your word. Thank you so much for this Bible Institute and the students that you've brought here and the blessing that they are to me and to each other. And uh, hopefully that their uh, ministries, Lord God, will be a blessing to uh, to the world. And may we reach the world for you, Lord God, and do your work and will and be faithful to what you have for us and walk in your will and way, Lord. Fortune in Christ, I'm going to pray all these things be with us today. We pray in the book of First Kings. Amen and amen. And so now we come to uh, our uh, our uh, seventh point. Actually, we left off uh, last uh, last time uh, with the uh, seventh point. Whenever we looked at Jeroboam's reign over Israel, and now we continue here with uh, Judah's kings. With Judah's kings, that's number seven. Judah's kings, chapter fourteen, verse twenty-one uh, to chapter fifteen, and verse number twenty-four. And the first one that uh, we uh, kind of conclude here, we looked at Rehoboam up in uh, point number six. And, uh, of course, you know, like with his request and because uh, he actually was harder on the uh, people of Israel than Solomon was, the ten northern tribes revolted. But here letter A, Rehoboam, chapter 14, verses 21 to 31. Uh, we see, uh, we have a review here of his reign. And, of course, he was a wicked king, a, another bad king that Judah had. And then letter B, we come to Abijam. Abijam, and that's a chapter 15, verses 1 to 8 with his reign. And he also was an evil king, unfortunately. Unfortunately, he was also an evil king. And it is through a couple of these kings here that uh, we have apostasy in Judah. But we're coming to a good one now. In letter C, we have Asa. Asa, chapter 15, verses 9 to 24. Asa, chapter 15, verses 9 uh, to 24. And what a great reign that he had. And uh, he was a good king. wasn't a perfect man. Uh, but uh, like we pick up here, verse number 11, he had some really good acts. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. And he took away the sodomites out of the land, so there's one thing that he did good, and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. See, one very impressive thing about their Asa was he changed the trend. He didn't continue in the way of his father and his grandfather. He did that which was right in the eyes of God. And see, that should encourage anybody and everybody. If you come from a bad lineage, if you had, um, uh, you know, bad as way to say it, if you're like Asa and you had parents that did not do right, you do not have to continue in their way. You can reverse the iniquity and the evil things that they did the way that Asa did. And we should all take that to heart for the day and time that we live in. You know, like some of us, like me, I'm glad to say I had good Christian parents. But, you know, even in the society that we live in, we can reverse what society has done. You know, in sodomy and idols, those are a couple of things that are very prevalent in the day and time that we live in. But Asa removed those things. See, and look there, verse number 13. And also, Mecha, his mother, even her, he removed from being queen because she had made an idol in a grove. <coughs> Excuse me. And Asa destroyed her idol and burned it by the brook Kedron. See, he even removed his wicked mother. And what an encouragement that that is. It's heartbreaking that his mother was that way, or it could have been his grandmother. Theologians are divided over the opinion of who that was exactly. But nonetheless, he removed her, whether if it was a mother or a grandmother. He removed her out of the land. Out of the way. No, he removed her from being queen, not out of the land. But he took her down, and he destroyed her idols. We see here the courage that he had, amen. In like verse number 15, and he brought in the things which his father had dedicated, and the things which himself had dedicated in the house of the Lord, silver and golden vessels. So he was a faithful man. He dedicated all of the good things to the house of God. 
just like we should do all the good things that we have to the house, to the things of God. You know, fill our time up. And we say that on here a lot and we'll continue because that's one thing that our society has gotten away from is giving a lot of time to things like prayer, the study of the word of God and being a witness because, you know, we have all this idols of entertainment. I don't mean to, you know, stay on a hobby horse with that. Well, I kind of do mean to, but, you know, I kind of hate to, but, you know, that's just the reality that we live in. You know, and that is a that is an enemy of revival. You know, if we really want to have revival and want God to really use us, we've got to give God our time. We've got to be faithful to the Word of God and faithful to pray and give all that we can to the good Lord. You know, make all of our life a dedication to God. Like King Asa, what a great example that we do have there. And now continuing on here with Israel's kings. And of course, as uh, we may have said before, all of Israel's kings were evil. They didn't have one good single one. Judah, you know, they, they had some good kings, but Israel, the northern kingdom, had none. And we go to letter 8, Israel's kings, chapter 15, verse 25, to chapter 16 and verse number 34. We have letter A, Nadab, chapter 15, verses 25 and 26. And then letter B, Basha, chapter 15, verse 27. To chapter 16 and verse number 7. And then letter C, we have the reign of Elah and the conspiracy of Zimri, chapter 16, verses 8 to 14. See, and that was a big power struggle there in the northern kingdom. You know, that was one reason why, uh, you know, that's just a result, you know, of iniquity. You know, it's having a power struggle and it's disappointing. But, you know, that, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, that even happens in churches. You know, we have people who are not there for the Lord, who don't want to please God. They just want to run everything. And whenever you do that, that's what happens. You have things like conspiracy. You just have iniquity. And that's why God was, the Spirit of God, unfortunately, was not in the Northern Kingdom. You know, other than by the prophets that they had. They had, you know, they had faithful prophets like Jose, Amos like Elijah that we're about to look at. But the kings, unfortunately, they were all wicked. They did not heed to the prophet's preaching. Then letter D, Zimri, seven-day reign, only reigned for seven days, chapter 16, verses 15 to 20. And then letter E, Omri, who started a dynasty, a wicked dynasty. Omri, chapter 16, verse 21 to verse 28. And see, we can see for all lands, just because for all nations, just because we have a good beginning doesn't mean that we will continue in that way. There has uh, never never been a nation and probably never will. I'm sure never will be a nation. I'm 99.9% .9 sure. Never will be a nation like Israel that had such a good prominent beginning. All that God had done for them brought them out of the land of Egypt from being slaves to give them their own land. But they didn't continue in God's ways. They just declined. And before you knew it, boom. And we'd see that. With nations in our day and time, like going back to England, you know, a nation where revival started, you know, in just a couple hundred years after, really just a hundred, I take that back, just a hundred years after, uh, you know, like, like with the pastorate of Charles Spurgeon in the 1800s and so forth, you know, it was just a couple of generations later and they were completely different from having a great man like Charles Spurgeon, of course, that doesn't even include all the great, you know, the great people they had in the, like, the 17th and 18th century, you know, from the 1600s and 1700s, like George Whitfield, John and Charles Wesley, and uh, George Mueller, and so forth. But just such a horrible decline over there, and it happened to the Northern Kingdom, you know, for going from such great blessings of God to just, you know, to just being a horrific nation, bad way to say it, you know, just so immoral. Now, and so ungodly, and just like the northern kingdom. Look, we have dynasties like with Omri that were just wicked and in pagan religion. Letter F, Ahab, chapter 16, verses 29 to 34. Of course, that's kind of just a little bit of a, a little bit of an overview there of, uh, of, of his reign. We'll have more to, uh, more to say about him in the conclusion of uh, First Kings today. So now we are going to switch gears. And look at the ministry of Elijah with all of the iniquity going on in the northern kingdom. What do they need? They need a preacher, amen. You know, just like places now need with all of our iniquity. What do we need? We need a preacher. You know, that's exactly what we need. We have a wicked society. 
But what do we need? You know, we need preachers. That's what I pray for. You know, we need fired up preachers. We need revivalists. He said, I know everybody, you know, has their own talent. Everybody has their own gift. You know, and that's one thing that we do here with this Bible Institute is to encourage people to exercise their gift. If that's somebody who's just been given the ministry of prayer, but I don't want to say just because that is a very, very, you know, big ministry, something God greatly uses. If that's somebody that, you know, has a special ministry of prayer, you know, if that's somebody who can write books and, you know, teach or whatever, wonderful. Uh, somebody, you know, just with a gift of preaching to go out, you know, and be a public witness. You know, somebody who has, you know, who has great people skills, whatever it might be. But no doubt, though, whatever your gift is, you know, we need preachers and exercise that gift as a preacher. Because that is desperately what our society needs. And we have some good things here with Elijah that we can run from. So learn from. So number nine, the ministry of Elijah, chapter 17, verse 1, to chapter 19, and verse number 21. And of course, we have here letter A, the drought, chapter 17, verses uh, 1 to 7. Like Elijah, he was a fiery preacher, and that's what we need now, fiery preachers. And we see here, see Elijah, he had a preparation. And that's something that I, that all of us are going to have. I've had it. You know, still have it. You know, still have it sometimes for you know more ministries and things that I want to do. But here, though, with the drought, you know, like whenever the Lord told Elijah there to go by the to go by the brook, you know, that was Elijah in preparation. Of course, he called for a drought, and it came. See, before being used of God publicly, though, Elijah was first taught two good lessons. While serving in obscurity. See there are times when our disappointments are God's appointments. See that brook dried up. But God had another place for Elijah. See we can't trust too much you know in things. See it was God who decided when it was time to leave not Elijah. See you know once again we have to go with God's leading. You know not our flesh. Not what other people think we should do. But what God would have us to do. See, when we trust more in something, more than someone, that being God, you know, God will remove it. Because God likes for us to keep leaning on Him, not on the things of the world. You know, I've had uh, that mistake a time or two in my life. You know, when I was leaning on something other than God. And God will provide for us, but God's going to provide for it in his way. You know, like it was actually, I've probably been said, you know, by somebody before, some preacher years ago or something or another. But the first time I actually remember seeing it was actually from the pastor of my sending church. Like uh, he said one time, you know, he took that, that word there, disappointment. See, if you just change a few letters there, disappointment goes to appointment. So you take that D-I-S off of that word and put A, it goes from disappointment to appointment. See, often our disappointments are just God's appointments. You know, I go back to Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. See, if we're living God's calling, living according to God's purpose, you know, we'll have those times when we are disappointed, but that's just God's appointments. You know, like, uh, like A.W. Tozer, you know, used to often say, I know, God doesn't greatly use somebody until he greatly hurts them. Because, you know, there'll be that time in our life, you know, when we're depressed, when we're just broken hearted. You know, you know, when we have that, you know, disappointment with whatever happened. But God, you know, he just uses that to prepare us for a work that he has for us. And it can be a great work if you know, we're willing to do things that we've already gone over here today. Like give, just give God all that we have, all our time, all our efforts, all our gifts, whatever it might be. And God will give us that which we need. See here, and we see the faith of Elijah growing. Here, letter, uh, letter B. Uh, let's see where we are. Yeah, letter B. The widow at Zarephath's meal expands. Chapter 17, verses 8 to 16. So Elijah, so Elijah goes there to that widow of Zarephath and, uh, and, uh, you know, she's ran out of, like, meal and oil and things. And it expands. See, God provided the needs of the widow after she put God's for, after she put God first. As evidenced by obeying 
God's man. Of course, we know God's man is just that he's a man, but he is God's man. You know, God has a reason for calling preachers to preach. You know, that is a calling. That is the one calling, you know, that we have there. You know, and I firmly believe that, that a man has to be called to preach in order, you know, to preach. I know I've heard some people say, uh, particularly kind of one stream of independent Baptists, I'm not going to say who they are, but like they believe somebody can volunteer for the ministry, and I don't believe that at all. Now, I do believe if somebody has a heart for the ministry, that if they really want it enough, God probably will call them. I do believe that, but like a lot of that crowd there that talks about, you know, volunteering for the ministry, I see a lot of their young people are voluntold to the ministry, you know, just because they were raised in an independent Baptist church or their daddy was a preacher, that, you know, they have to come upon a preacher, but they don't even want to do it. You know, they're just doing it because their dad was, and that's what their parents expect them to do. But, you know, it is a calling, but nonetheless, going back to what we were originally saying here, you know, you know, we obey God's man. And I think that is especially true for young preachers, you know, especially true for myself before. You know, like God's called you to preach and God's put you in a church, you know, you be obedient to that pastor. Of course, now if he gets, you know, off on, you know, does something wrong, you know, if that's a man that, <coughs> excuse me, if that's a man that gets some moral or if that's a man, you know, who's doctrinally wrong, then obviously, you know, there's a time to separate from somebody from doing that. But if that's a man, though, that God has put there, a man that's, you know, doctrinally straight and doing right, you know, you help him in any way you can. You know, he wants you to go visiting or whatever, you know, then you be faithful to do that. Because if you, you know, you're worried about your soul in life, if you are submissive to pastoral authority, then, you know, the people that God gives you when you start your church, whatever ministry God has for you, you know, you're going to reap what you sow there, and people will be obedient to your pastoral authority, because that is very biblical. And then we have here letter uh, letter, uh, letter C, the widow of Zarephath's son restored to life, chapter 17, verses 17 to 24. See, the dry brook was Elijah's test, you know, while the dead boy was the widow's test. See, and great blessings are usually followed by great testings. That's something, too, to keep in mind. See, that's really whenever somebody is the most vulnerable to satanic deception, to giving in to temptation, is right after a great victory, after a great blessing. You know, it's often, you know, after we have a great victory, you know, we're kind of up here, hey, you know, I've prayed for all these hours, I've been in the Word of God all these hours, or God has provided a need that we've prayed for for a long time. Then oftentimes, just kind of after that, though, you know, whenever we're kind of the most vulnerable to the devil, the devil says, well, then you can come over here and enjoy this for a while after you've done all that. That's really when we're the most vulnerable. And see, God had provided, you know, meal for this lady here, and now her son has passed away. Like chapter 17, verses 16 and 17. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. But, you know, we know that he was healed. He was restored back to life. <clears throat> and so just, uh, you know, great works there by Elijah. And continuing on here, letter D, the meeting with Ahab, chapter 18, verses 1 to 16. See, if you try to do something for God, you know, you're going to be met by opposition, by great opposition. You know, you want to be great, great for God, then, you know, guess what? You're going to have great, great opposition. See, the devil shoots big guns at big people. And if you have big plans, which you should, I mean, big plans for doing things for God, for, you know, what, what you know, a heart for revival, you know, whatever that might be, you know, going to be a great pastor, a great church planner, you know, you're going to be very faithful and just, you know, give God everything that you have. You're not going to pay attention to anything that the world has, but you're just going to be 100% all for the Lord. That's wonderful. But, you know, there's going to be great opposition there. <clears throat> and see, Elijah, he had to, he had to deal with closet Christianity, and that's you know a lot of Christians that we have now. That's what they are. They're only Christians in the closet. See, closet Christians will exercise their faith in private, or kind of more so maybe at church when they're at church, because they fear the Lord 
but they're crippled in public because they equally fear man. See, it's easy to be a Christian, you know, at church. You know, really easy there to be a Christian in the church. I don't want us so much, I maybe don't want us so much say in complete privacy, because complete privacy, when it's just you and God, that really shows what kind of person you are. And we're actually going to get to that a little bit more later. But a closet Christianity, probably a better term, you know, would be church Christianity. Somebody who's a Christian when they're at church, you know, around other Christians when you're expected to be a good person. Second first Kings eighteen nine and he said, What have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? See, you know, we have to combat that just being a Christian. You know, whenever we're at church. See, if you have to convince others that you're a Christian, you're not a very good one if people don't know that. <laughs> and see, that goes back to the idols and everything. You know, like in, uh, uh, kind of going back to the time, you know, when I was a young kid being raised in upstate South Carolina, like in the late 80s and the early 90s. You know, that was, uh, NASCAR is still pretty popular there, but definitely during that time, you know, that was all NASCAR country. You know, and everybody either liked Fords or Chevrolets. Like Pontiacs during that time were also a NASCAR, but that was also one by General Motors, so Pontiacs was kind of just a subcategory, I think more so of uh, like a Chevrolet. But, you know, back during then, you know, often you knew people as being a Ford fan or a Chevrolet fan. Not everybody. There were some good Christians there, but, you know, that that's what people identify themselves as so much, though. You know, an NASCAR fan as being for Fords or Chevrolets. And then, you know, I lived in central Alabama for a while. You know, all about college football, you know, known as an Alabama fan or an Auburn fan. And then, you know, back when I was in Canada, you know, a Toronto Maple Leafs fan, an Ottawa Senators fan or a Montreal Canadiens fan. But what do people know us as? Do they know us as some sports fan or, or you know, somebody that loves Hollywood movies, somebody that's interested in Star Wars or, you know, this, that or the other? You know, do, do we have to convince people that we are a Christian? What do people say when they find out you're a Christian? Oh, really? I didn't know. Or, you know, did they know that? Well, yeah, I already knew you were a Christian. I see how you act. I see your speech. I see what you're about. See, 1 Kings eighteen thirteen. Was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? How I hid an hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And, of course, also Elijah, he was against cults. He was against idols, like the prophets of Baal. And see, we have there, letter, uh, letter E now in our outline, the contest on Mount Carmel, chapter 18, verses 17 to 46. See, lost people are always wanting to blame other people for their problems rather than blaming their sins. But, you know, we have lost people especially. You know, they have problems because of sin. You know, we have a fallen world. You know, our government is in such disarray. You know, every country's government is in such disarray. The U.S., Canada, Mexico, North America, South America, Europe, Africa, you know, Asia, whatever. You know, and lots of those countries, just about all countries now, you know, that they have all these problems because of sin. But see, lost people, you know, are just that. They're lost people. You know, they're just like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You know, after they, you know, after they took of that fruit, you know, they weren't seeking God. You know, God was calling them. God was saying, Adam, Adam. But Adam wasn't going back to God. Adam was covering up his sin, you know, trying to run from God. You know, there we have a good, you know, we have the picture of sin. That's like people in this day and time. You know, they're not going to blame their sin, you know, for their problems. You know, they're just going to run from God, you know, and try to cover themselves up. But 1 Kings 18, 17, And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Say, it's exactly what the world does, does it not? You know, they blame Christians for the problems. Well, you know, you people who are, you know, who are Christians, who are Bible believers, you know, who are you know, pro-life, or, you know, you have, we have problems, we do, because, you know, you're against sodomy, you're against homosexuals, you know, you don't think they should be allowed to marry and show their pride, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. you know, you're against alcohol, you know, you're against fun, you're against Hollywood, you know, whatever it might be, you know, they blame us for the problems, but it's their sin that's the problem, you know, it's because, you know, all they ever put out on television, you know, was all of Hollywood's wickedness and everything. You know, that's why we have sin problems. You know, it's not Bible believers. It's not people that love God's holiness. 
It's because of their sin. They blame us, but it's not our fault. It's their fault. See, God wants people who will acknowledge him and who will judge sin. See, you know, that's a big part of being of being a preacher. You know, being a Christian, but especially, you know, being a preacher. You know, we must reprove sin. You know, being a pastor. You know, that's all through the Bible. You know, we're to mark and avoid those, you know, who are, who are false prophets. You know, we must reprove sin. That's not popular. You know, that won't score you a lot of brownie points anywhere in this day and time. But, you know, that is very, very biblical. So you notice all the people, that all the people acknowledge God, but only Elijah killed the false prophets. See, we must reprove sin and call it out, you know, and separate from it. You know, that's especially what you have to do as a pastor or a church planner. You know, you have to be very clear in reproving sin and reproving false prophets. You know, being very clear about what the Bible is against. See, 1 Kings 18, 39 to 40. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And see, and that's what we mentioned before, something that we want to note here about Elijah, you know, in his private life. What we do with God in private is more important than what God does for us in public. Because, see, that's where battles are won. Like, you probably heard that expression before. Battles are won on your knees, and that's very true. That's where the power of God is. How much time, you know, what, what do we do with our private time? See, that really shows what your character is when it's just you and God. Especially, you know, for a man of God. You know, what do we do when there's nobody around? You know, yes, you know, kind, kind of going a little bit before that. You know, what are we like at home? What do we like with our children, with our wife? You know, how do we treat them? <clears throat> you know, what is our character like when it's just, you know, our immediate family, people that we're very comfortable around? Are we godly? You know, what is our mannerisms? You know, are we godly and respectful towards them? We should be. We should be. You know, do we love them? You know, are we being that godly example to our wives, to our children, or, you know, if you're a lady, same scenario. Very, very equally applicable to you, obviously. You can't be called to preach, but, you know, equally ap equally applicable to your character. You know, for everybody. What do we do with our private time? You know, are we, you know, you know, spending that time praying? Are we really prayer warriors like people claim? I'm a prayer warrior. Good, but are we really a prayer warrior? Do we really spend hours in prayer? You know, are we really in the Word of God? You know, are we praying? You know, reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, letting the Lord, you know, speak to us? Like, that's what Paul told Timothy, rightly divide the Word. You know, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Are we that workman in the Word of God? You know, that's a major, you know, aspect of our ministry. You know, is our preaching, you know, really, you know, is our preaching really deep or, you know, is it shallow? Are we really deep in the Word of God? Do we really know the Bible? You know, are we really fellowshipping with God, letting him speak to us, us talking to God? Well, see, that definitely is. You know, that's where the battle's won. You have a strong prayer life, you have a strong Bible study life, then, you know, your public ministry is going to be powerful. Like that great Puritan John Owen, you know, used to always say, a minister may fill his pews, his communion roll, the mouths of the public, but what that minister is on his knees in secret before God Almighty, that he is and no more. That just shows, you know, what you are in your private time when you're praying and studying the Word of God. Let's see, if we're doing much with God in private, then God will do much with us in public. But see, if we are unwilling for God to prepare us through trouble, then we will be unable to persevere. You know, like, like whenever something happens, you know, that that's a really good test right there, you know, with character. Like when something happens, you know, do we really have faith when something happens? That's very applicable to everybody. You know, like a car breaks down. I'm not trying to slide anybody's trouble because I've been there before myself. I hate that. You know, I've had car trouble as a married man. I had car trouble as a single man, you know, and I was in the military. Car trouble don't feel good, but just using that as one illustration. But, you know, where's our faith at when things like that do happen? Are we trusting God to, you know, bring us through it? <clears throat> or, you know, whenever somebody gets cancer or somebody gets some type of disease, you know, something goes wrong, you know, 
like I mentioned, car trouble, you know, but, you know, something in the house breaks and we have to replace a refrigerator, a washer, a dryer, you know, something like that. You know, what kind of character do we have? Now, I'm not necessarily saying that you have to be there and smile about it, you know. No, I mean, anybody's going to do that, but are we really trusting God or do we just lose it? You know, do we just lose it? Oh, now this has happened and that's happened. Or, you know, do we have faith? You know, do we say, Lord, I hate it that this has happened, but I know you have a reason for it. Please just help me to have faith and help, you know, help us get it resolved. You know, I'm not trying to slight the issues that people have. I've, I've been there with just about all of it. Well, I've not been there really so much with, you know, health, you know, with, with you know, health sickness, but like with car trouble, things happen in a house. I've been there with that myself more, more times than I'd like to. <clears throat> <clears throat> But, you know, whenever that trouble does happen, you know, whenever we're just like Elijah, you know, when that brook dries up, you know, look at the issue that he had. You know, he didn't know where his next meal was coming from. He didn't know where, you you know, where he was going to get any water to drink anymore. You know, that was even beyond, you know, just having something like a washer or a dryer break. He had even a bigger issue. But see, that's preparation. But see, them once again. You know, why is it that we don't have powerful preachers like that in this day and time? Like, why is it that we haven't really had, you know, a John Wesley or a Charles Finney or a Charles Spurgeon or an R.A. Torrey in the 21st century? You know, because of that. Nobody really has faith. Nobody's going to persevere. See, that's something that I actually meant to mention before. Like, I mentioned great opposition. Like, those great revivalists. They suffered great, great opposition, and I'll mention probably a little bit of that before with this Bible Institute. But, you know, those were men, you know, that they had to endure people who were literally possessed with demons. You know, go, go read some of their works, you know, some of the things they mentioned. <clears throat> you know, there were people who wanted to kill John Wesley and George Whitfield. I mean, George Whitfield is a man that was beat up before. You know, they went to John Wesley's house one time and wanted to kill him. But, you know, by, you know, just by the, you know, by the intervention of God, you know, also he was able to, you know, he was able to get through by the grace of God. But you see, that opposition was there. And they could have easily just ran. That's actually what we're going to look at with Elijah here. Unfortunately, you know, he also did that one time. But, you know, great opposition is coming. But, you know, where's our faith? You know, where's our faith? You know, we don't, people in this day and time, God doesn't put through that type of opposition of people actually wanting to kill you. Because, you know, like I said, unfortunately, we have people in this day and time, you know, when a washer breaks, when a dryer breaks, we have car trouble. You know, we have people that can't even handle that the way that they should. You know, and because of that, we just, we have people that don't really have the faith like they ought to have. But now here, letter F, coming to a conclusion here today, letter F, Elijah's discouragement and renewal. And see, problems are only as big as we let them become. You know, we must have real, real faith. See, Elijah stood against 850 false prophets, but he ran away from one angry woman, 1 Kings 19, 1 to 3. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And with all how he had slain all the prophets with a sword, then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, so let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. And once again, I know, I'm not trying to slight the issue here. We see even Elijah was a man who ran and was afraid. But we got to have more faith in that. we got to have more faith in that. You know, we cannot run. Whenever somebody gets mad, or even when a multitude gets mad, whoever that might be. But thank God, Elijah, you know, he did get renewed. But see, discouragement comes only when God refuses to cooperate with us, you know, when we have our own plan. So, you know, that, that's a major issue, you know. We have things lined up, you know, we're going to be here, 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 doing this, this, and this, and this, and this. But then God has other plans. Because, see, Elijah wanted the spectacular fire from heaven, while God wanted the spiritual, just a still, small voice. See, 1 Kings 19, 12, After the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a still, small voice. See, Elijah wanted broken heads, but God wanted broken hearts. And that's a really good point there. See, often, you know, when it comes to lost people or... Or people who are just wicked, you know, just unfaithful church members or whatever. 
You know, we often want God to break people's heads, but sometimes God just wants broken hearts. You know, God doesn't want to necessarily break anybody's head yet and put them in the grave or put them in the hospital. But God will break their heart, though. See, and we have to operate on God's plan and not ours. And Elijah was renewed because discouragement happens to everybody. We all have those times. And as I said, I'm not trying to slight that. I'm not by any means saying that I have arrived. Because we see Elijah, he was a phenomenal, phenomenal man of God. But even he had that discouragement. But that discouragement came, though, because, you know, God didn't cooperate with his plans. And we must cooperate with God's plans. And then lastly here, and we'll be through, just to mention these, number 10 here, closing out the book of First Kings. Number 10, the concluding reigns of uh, 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 1, to chapter 22, and verse number 53. And letter A here, continuing on with that reign of Ahab, letter A, Ahab wars with Syria, chapter 20, verses 1 to 43. And then letter B, Ahab covets Naboth's vineyard, chapter 21, verses 1 to 29. See, that's fruits there. That's things that always come with wickedness. It's covetousness. See, we looked before. We looked at how they wanted power. See, and now they want material things. See, that's what happens. See, that's just the fruits of worldliness. You know, do we really want the things of God or do we want the things of the world? See, that's a good picture, like of a spiritual church. What do people in the church want? Do they want the blessings of God? Do they want the things of God? Or do they want the things of the world? Then letter C, we have the death of Ahab, chapter 22, verses 1 to 40. And then letter D, we do have another good king here, letter D, Jehoshaphat of Judah, chapter 22, verses 41 and 50. See, and he did it right. And Jehoshaphat, starting here, verse number 41. And Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, see, he had a godly father, began to reign over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. Jehoshaphat was thirty and five years old when he began to reign. And he reigned twenty and five years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Asuba, the daughter of Shelah. And he walked in all the ways of Asa's father. He turned not aside from it during that which was right, doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. See, he did that was right in the eyes of the Lord. But he wasn't complete, though. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. See, the high places is where is where uh, pagans worshipped. See, and Asa didn't take them away either, but they should have. That was one thing that they did wrong. For the people offered and burned incense yet in the high places. And Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. Now, the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and and his might that he shewed, and how he warred, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? See in verse number 46, And the remnant of the Sodomites, which remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. See, he took away the rest of the Sodomites that were there, that had been left over, and that's good. But see, they didn't remove the high places, and we're going to look in Second Kings at a couple of kings, at least one I know, that did remove the high places. So that's uh, <clears throat> that'll be great to look at here whenever we get into the book of Second Kings. But let's try to do that, though. Let's not leave any, any type of wickedness in our lives, anything that was left over from our parents, from society, whatever it might be. Let's be 100% right with God. They were good kings, and I appreciate them for that very much. Like Asa and Jehoshaphat. They were good, they were godly, but they weren't quite complete. And so let's be complete, amen, and even remove those high places. And thank you for being with us, and what a wonderful time we've had in the Word of God. What great encouragement, what great things we can glean there from His Word. And let's all continue on to be faithful and to do that which God would have us to do, amen, and exercise our gift and be that faithful believer that, uh, that the Lord certainly needs during this time, amen. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we will pick up there next class with uh, the book of Second Kings, continuing here, looking at the reigns 
of the kings and a lot of things that we can glean from that. And we'll close in prayer. Our Father, we sure do love you. Thank you for this time that we've had together in the word of God. And I pray that you just bless your people. Thank you so much for meeting with us here. And may we just glean much, Lord, like from the ministry of Elijah and uh, from these kings, Lord God, what to do, what not to do. Pray that we would be complete and that we would stand those tests. I know that opposition comes and it's going to be hard to bow down. But I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't, that we would just stand strong for you and that we would continue to go on, Lord God, and be used of thy honor and glory. And just help us and be with us, Lord, like only you can. And I bless each student, bless all aspects of this institute, each one that takes part. And just help us, we pray, Lord, to do that which you'd have us to do. For it's in Christ, bless and we do pray all these things. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, folks, for being with us. And we'll see you next class. The day breaks and the shadows flee away. I am Dr. Cooper, and I love you, and I appreciate you.